Hello there and a warm welcome to yet another edition of Eco at Africa. My name is Joy Doreen Bira and we're coming to you from the outskirts of Nairobi City here in Kenya. I'm not alone on the show. I've got my colleague NT in Nigeria. NT, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Hello Joy and hello everybody. I'm Neota Igbe in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, Joy and I will be bringing you the latest exciting environmental stories from all over Africa and Europe. Today, we will be visiting a 19-year-old German girl who volunteered to work with an organization abroad for a year to provide solar energy in Zanzibar. We will meet an entrepreneur in Zimbabwe who is turning waste into art. And we will find out how cooling trucks in South Africa can go green. In Germany, high school graduates often take a gap year before going to university. Yusula Witken decided to spend her year out in quite a unique way. She's volunteering in an environmental organization in Zanzibar and helping to promote the use of solar power on the island. She doesn't earn much money, has to learn the local language and of course to adapt to a new culture and way of life. How is she coping with all these challenges? We visited her to find out how. Take a look. When Ursula Witterkind first arrived in Zanzibar 10 months ago, she barely spoke a word of Swahili. She's a volunteer with Reza, the Renewable Energy Zanzibar Association. She and her colleagues visit villages, selling solar power units to locals. It wasn't easy to come here as a white person who couldn't speak the language, but now I've learned some Swahili. Today she's in Kibini, a village with about 3,000 inhabitants. The NGO sells the solar power units for the equivalent of 70 euros. That's half what they normally cost. Orzala explains that they can be paid off in installments. When they see volunteers talking in Swahili, they, they feel like, ah, it's not possible, yeah. And then finally, when the volunteer expressed by himself or herself, so now they get impression and they try to believe. It is different. When we go alone and when we go to the, together with the volunteer, it's different. The 19-year-old volunteer from Germany covers her head and wears modest dress when she visits the villages. The island's population is Muslim. The small solar power units have already been introduced in about 20 villages. <laughs> the NGO headquarters are in Zanzibar city. Ozola works here with three others. Today she and her colleague Patima are designing promotional flyers. Before we met, I was looking forward to getting to know each other's cultures, and now we get along very well. Going into the villages has made Ozola realize just how helpful solar energy can be. In Germany, people are interested in renewable energies because they're into green issues and want to protect the environment. People here are motivated to use renewables for those reasons too but mainly because most villages are off-grid. She lives with a host family and travels half an hour to work every day by Dala Dala, as the minibuses are called here. She writes about her experiences in Zanzibar in a weekly blog for Deutsche Welle. I like blogging because it makes you reflect on what you're doing and you illustrate it with photos. I must admit I much prefer blogging to writing a normal work experience report. When she gets home from work, she enjoys helping her host family make the evening meal. It's all very different from what she's used to, but she's embraced this new culture and enjoys every new experience. It's also been a new experience for her host mother. To begin with, I expected her to be very different, but now that we've lived together for a while, I've realized that the main difference is just the clothes she wears. To begin with, she wore trousers. Some girls here also wear trousers, but then they wear an abaya over them. Ozola Vutikind has completely immersed herself in the culture of her temporary home, 
and fulfilled two ambitions in the process, living abroad and working with renewable energies. I didn't think it would be such a learning experience. I'll take away so much more than I expected. Ozola's year of volunteering in Zanzibar will be over in just a few weeks. We at EcoAd Africa were impressed by Ursula, so we asked her to write a blog about her everyday life for us. If you want to know more about her adventures, please visit the website www.dw.com forward slash co-blog and learn more about it. And well, of course, we've got more happening in West Africa. NT, tell us more about this. In Nigeria in 2015, over 20 children died of lead poisoning in the village of Shikira in northern Nigeria. The government promised to help build a hospital and to supply the village with fresh drinking water. An activist, Hamza Lawal, is in Shikira. He's committed himself to the fight against corruption and traveled to the village to monitor whether the government has delivered on its pledges and to see if the situation for the locals and for the environment has improved. Residents in the village of Shakira are trying to put the past behind them. In May 2015, more than 20 children here died of lead poisoning after drinking contaminated water. We took my son to the hospital and they told us he had been exposed to lead. He later died. We are now very careful. We hope we'll be able to protect ourselves better in the future. Luckily, the residents of Shakira have a champion here, a few hundred kilometers away in Abuja. Activist Hamza Laval is committed to fighting corruption in Nigeria. His initiative, called Follow the Money, monitors government spending and finds out where the money really goes. It then publishes its findings. Laval is traveling to Shakira. For him, this visit is about more than just cleaning up the water. How can we ensure that we can still keep that momentum going beyond just environmental cleanup and uh, uh, access to healthcare services? The activist arrives to see things for himself. Most families in Shakira make their living from gold mining. Young people dig deep holes in the ground, hoping to strike gold. They then crush the ore to extract the precious mineral. But the ore also contains lead, which is ground into dust. The toxic particles eventually find their way into the water supply. The miners and their families are slowly being poisoned. The government is turning a blind eye to the root causes, despite its promises to help. We are shot interview with our mobile phones uh, and also taking pictures of them and, and sharing this information on Twitter and Facebook and calling them to action and showing them this evidence-based uh, uh, data. The government has kept its promise to build a new health center. It was built after the number of lead poisoning cases began to grow and more children began to die. It means that finally, lives can be saved. My child began to convulse. I've been bringing her here regularly for treatment, and now she's doing better. Hamzat Laval is monitoring the whole process. Although gold diggers are still working the lead-contaminated earth, he's happy about the health center. You can see family members coming to access health care services for their children under five years who, have been, who were contaminated by lead poisoning and now receiving treatment and feeling much better. It's quite exciting for us. Although little has been done to provide alternative means of employment, the government says it will try to regulate gold mining operations in Shakira. Anti-corruption activists say they'll make sure that doesn't remain an empty promise.